the warning to a town about her fate. If she is a martyr, she's a people's martyr and a union martyr. She was a sort of symbol, a Joan of Arc in a way. Once Karen set her sights on something, she was very strong-willed. Karen Silkwood took on one of the biggest companies in America. If Kerr McGee had made her mad about something, she was an antagonistic enough. The risk wouldn't have mattered to her if she'd have done anything. She felt a moral obligation to do whatever she possibly could to try and see that things were improved there. If she could do it all over again and know what the outcome was going to be, would she still be as willing to give up everything? for what she believed in. I just hate people talking about me that way. Karen, the company's got to blame somebody, otherwise it's their fault. In 1983, Karen Silkwood's tragedy became a cause celeb. They're trying to kill me. Hollywood had transformed her ordeal into a hit film starring Cher, Kurt Russell, and Meryl Streep in the title role. The movie, which earned Streep an Oscar nomination, told the story of a lone woman crusading against America's nuclear power industry. It turned Karen Silkwood into a modern-day martyr. But what it does is tells you what kind of uh, person Karen Silkwood was and what kind of people evolve into mythical heroes and real heroes. She's both. In February 1946, as Texans were easing back to civilian life after World War II, a young housewife named Merle Silkwood gave birth to her first child, a daughter named Karen. Shortly after Karen was born, Merle and her husband Bill settled in Nederland, a small town east of Houston, surrounded by oil refineries. Merle got a job as a bank teller and Bill as a union painter. Over the next 12 years, the couple had two more daughters, Rosemary and Linda. The precocious Karen often took care of her little sisters. Mom worked, so Karen was a lot of times in charge when she was gone, or Daddy was working too. And and so she just um, mainly looked after us like a mother would. She taught me how to tie a bow when I was probably about five years old using my Easter bunny I received for Easter. She was friendly and helped the other children and she tutored a little boy down the street from us because he wasn't doing good in his classwork. The spunky young Karen was a familiar sight in Nederland, playing tennis with her friends and riding her bike around town. She was an adventurous tomboy who never spent much time on her appearance. She didn't have to. She was a natural beauty. What I remember about Karen was her hair and her skin, mostly. It was the darker olive skin, and then when she smiled, her teeth were just white, and I thought that that was just really beautiful. She wasn't the type to sit around and worry about brushing her hair or putting her makeup on or wouldn't go out of the house because she didn't have her makeup on. She wasn't that type of person. She was more interested in taking care of business. Karen loved music and learned to play the flute in fourth grade. She played in the band all the way through her senior year at Nederland High. Band wasn't the only activity that kept young Karen busy. The straight-A student had a steady boyfriend, played on the volleyball team, and belonged to the National Honor Society and Science Club. Karen's father encouraged all of her endeavors. She was a lot like my dad in a way that she used to love to go out to his camp with him. She enjoyed the outdoors. Her father also coached her in her favorite subjects, math and science. So when Karen had the chance to take chemistry, the determined teenager insisted she was up to the challenge, even though she'd be the only girl in class. She never let adversities get in her way. You know, she didn't let people, what they thought, like all the other girls 
why would you want to take chemistry? That's just, you should be in home economics, not chemistry, right? Karen's parents sometimes worried about their daughter's headstrong attitude. She had her own ideas of how to do things, and uh, not she was disobedient and nothing. She liked to do things her way. She was like her father. She was a very stubborn person. When she uh, got hold of something, she just hung on like a pit bull. While Karen wasn't afraid to take risks, she was still a typical teenage girl. What we did back then was you went, you either got married right out of high school or you went to college long enough to find a husband. One summer, Karen volunteered as a candy striper at Mid-Jefferson County Hospital. Her parents urged her to go into nursing, a traditional career for young women. Karen had her own ideas and set her sights on becoming a medical researcher. She graduated from high school with honors in June 1964 and won a scholarship to Lamar University's Institute of Technology in Beaumont. She would be the first in her family to attend college. It was a big accomplishment for her to receive a scholarship. And she was very proud. We were all very proud of her. But Karen's life on the academic track would soon be derailed. That summer, she stayed with her grandparents in East Texas. One Sunday at church, she met a 17-year-old named Bill Meadows, who was visiting from California. For Karen, a small-town girl who longed to see the world, Bill was intriguing. The teenagers immediately hit it off. She had jet black hair, real dark complexion. She looked like a little Indian girl more than anything else. And uh, she was real sexy. She was a good-looking girl. Karen and Bill's attraction turned into a summer romance. She was a little bit more outgoing than most of the girls were back in those particular days. She pretty well said what was on her mind, and uh, she was game to try just about anything you wanted to do. In August, the young couple parted ways. Bill left to finish high school, and Karen went back to Nederland to start college. They wrote letters to each other over the winter. Then in 1965, at the end of Karen's freshman year, Bill returned for her. Without a word to anyone, Karen skipped town with him, hoping to marry in Louisiana. But they were too young, and no one would perform the ceremony. Without me being 21, they weren't going to let us get married. And since we hadn't told anybody we were leaving except my granddad, we decided it'd be easier to just go back and tell them we'd gotten married while we were gone, and that's exactly what we did. The couple returned to Texas and told everyone they knew that they were married. In her headlong rush to start a new life with Bill, Karen Silkwood shocked her family and gave up her college scholarship. But marriage and motherhood turned out to be more than Karen bargained for. Karen Silkwood walked away from a college scholarship to elope with 18-year-old Bill Meadows. Karen's impetuous decision stunned her family. It was a total surprise, I, I, I feel like, to all of us. Just totally blown away and hoped for the best. Sad that she wouldn't be there. She wasn't going to be at home with us anymore. She was going to be with him. Karen's father was furious that she'd given up on her education. He refused to give the couple his blessing. He wouldn't speak to Bill and would never forgive him for taking his daughter away. None of the families were for their relationship, which probably, you know, drew him. My dad was a rebel. Karen was a rebel, so I'm sure it drew him closer. <laughs> Karen's first year with Bill was an adventure. They moved to Corsicana, Texas, southeast of Dallas. Bill got a job as a machinist for mobile oil, Karen as a clerk for a hat company. Whenever they could, they hit the road, driving hundreds of miles just to see the country. Bill's rebellious nature unleashed the more daring side of Karen. We used to go down to Lake Dallas and jump off of the railroad trestle into the lake, which was about 40, 50 feet high. She kept doing that. The last time she did, she was, I think, seven months pregnant with Christy. Karen gave birth to a daughter, Christy, 
in November 1966. Two years later, a son, Michael, was born and the family moved to Duncan, Oklahoma. There, 24-year-old Karen gave birth to a third child, Dawn, in 1970. She took good care of the kids. She took real good care of them. She made sure they had everything they needed and kept them nice and clean and well-fed. We had happy kids. But as Karen's family grew, her common-law marriage started to crumble. We knew she was having problems in the marriage. And at one point, she had even moved back home with the kids. And Bill called, talked her into coming back, said things would be different. So she tried it again. Money was tight, and creditors hounded the couple. They were forced to declare bankruptcy. Karen's husband was spending more time away from home indulging in his two passions, motorcycles and women. Karen found out that Bill was having an affair. He cheated on her in a very serious way to the point where he was in love with the other woman and wanted to marry her. And she was devastated by that. The identity of this other woman was no mystery to Karen. Her husband's new girlfriend worked at the motorcycle shop where he moonlighted. Bill would often bring the children with him to the garage. I fell in love with her kids and we'd watch them occasionally and then she didn't come around the shop much. But a lot of times Bill had the kids over there so I thought they were the cutest things I ever saw the first time I drove up. Hurt and humiliated, Karen demanded a divorce. Bill refused unless she agreed to give up custody of the children. Karen knew she could not support them on her own, so she made one of the most painful decisions of her life. She says, I'm leaving, and I'm leaving in a couple of days, but I want you to know, and I want you to want to know if you're going to be here for the kids. I said, yeah, just let me, if that's what you're going to do, let me know when. She says, I know you'll love them and take care of them. In 1972, after seven years together, Karen left Bill and her three children, ages five, three, and 22 months. It was on a Saturday morning because cartoons were on, and she told me she was going to run up to the store and get some cigarettes to keep an eye on my brother and sister. And she walked out that door, and she didn't ever come back in. As a young adult, a young child, it's still kind of it's still kind of hurt that she would leave because I can't imagine leaving my children for anything. For the second time in her young life, Karen left behind the world she knew. She headed north to Oklahoma City, 80 miles away from her children. Now, she's no longer a mother. She's no longer a wife. And she has to become a bread earner. Karen heard that Oklahoma's largest employer, energy company Kerr McGee, was hiring lab technicians at its Cimarron River Plutonium Processing Plant in the nearby town of Crescent. Kerr McGee was one of the leaders in energy. The company was one of the first to look ahead and see that uh, there was going to be uh, a need for uranium and nuclear fuels. This was the opportunity Karen had dreamed of, a career in science in the booming nuclear power industry. It was a good job. Most of us kind of liked working there. We felt like we were doing something that was worthwhile. We were helping the company. Um, maybe we were doing something that um, was good for the country, good for humanity. In early August 1972, Karen received minimal training and began working in the metallurgy lab. She polished fuel rods packed with radioactive plutonium pellets and checked for faults where the rods were sealed shut. She learned how to handle these materials in a closed so-called glove box. Now she's on her own and she has a job, a very important job in a big company, a Fortune 500 company, in a very nice place, a lab, where she could do scientific work. She wanted to excel. Karen had also met an exciting new man at the plant. Within a month, she and Drew Stevens were a couple. Drew was also going through a divorce, and he and Karen found comfort in each other. He showed her the ropes in town and on the job. 
He was um, just a cool, good-looking guy. She must have been something to get a guy like Drew as interested in her as he obviously was. Karen's energy and willingness to learn appealed to Drew. He was concerned about safety issues at the plant and convinced Karen to join the Oil, Chemical and Atomic Workers Union. She had been working at the plant for just three months when the union went on strike for better wages and safer working conditions. Kerr McGee made no concessions and the strike failed miserably. It was back to work as usual. There was bitterness all over the plant. People who didn't belong to the union uh, felt that Kerr McGee was now going to take it out on the workers and make things worse. And the union got nothing except 10 weeks uh, on the picket line. The union had lost more than its fight. The strike had deepened the wedge between non-union workers and activists like Karen Silkwood. Walking the picket lines hardened her resolve and prepared her for a very dangerous mission. In January 1973, 26-year-old Karen Silkwood was among the last to abandon the picket lines in a strike against the Kerr-McGee nuclear processing plant in Crescent, Oklahoma. The experience inspired Silkwood. Her father, a union man, had taught her to stand up for her convictions, and she had always been quick to lend a hand. She was the kind of person that if you were her friend, if, if, if she thought of you as a quality person and... Um, could help you out, um, she would. I remember telling her that we had no television, and she said, I have a television, and, you know, here, take my old TV. Karen now spent much of her free time with her boyfriend, Drew Stevens, and their friends. She was more outspoken than other women at the plant, and was known for being flirtatious and provocative. Drew told me about a worker at the plant who had a big crush on Karen and was constantly following her around and doing whatever he could to get her attention. But at one point, Drew told me that she uh, caught him in one of those airlocks and flashed him. <laughs> and that told me a lot about the kind of person Karen Silkwood was. Karen experimented with her newfound freedom. She smoked marijuana, went to bars, and followed her boyfriend Drew's lead. Part of his charm was that he was, uh, you know, a bit of a rebel, and he, uh, he was a bit reckless. He liked to race cars, and he even got Karen involved in racing. Karen became a skilled driver, riding motorbikes on the mud flats near the plant, and racing her own specially outfitted Honda in motocross events. She shared her victories with her parents and sisters in phone calls and occasional visits, but she rarely made the two-hour drive to see her children. Basically, she was gone. I just figured she was so wrapped up in what her new life and what she was doing that uh, she just didn't really have the time. I remember hearing, thinking I would hear her coming in the door, you know, or hear a noise, and I would think she's coming home, and it never happened. <laughs> I always figured if she ever got her feet back under her and, and gotten things kind of lined out in her life that she would be back for them. I always had that in the back of my head. In fact, Karen was becoming distracted. Kerr McGee had fallen behind on a big contract to produce nuclear fuel rods for the federal government and was pushing its workers to the breaking point. Twelve-hour shifts, seven days a week, left Karen exhausted and angry. Mistakes became more common. So did airborne radiation leaks. We occasionally went to respirators. There was an alert when they said everybody on respirators never felt completely protected by one because of the way it seals around your face. The plant did not shut down after accidents, and protective gear was cumbersome, making the long shifts unbearable. Workers were unaware of the extreme risks of radiation exposure. I've heard lots of stories from people who worked at that plant and who knew Karen about, uh, about what went on. They used to play a game, you know, who could get hot the quickest. And by hot, I mean contaminated with plutonium because it meant they went in, they took a shower, they got scrubbed down a little bit, and then they got the rest of the day off. 
Then in July 1974, Karen was contaminated for the first time. Air sample filters in her lab read hot, indicating airborne radiation. She was the only one on her shift who had been exposed to plutonium, which made her fear that the incident was a veiled threat from someone at the plant. She was a sort of vivacious personality, rebellious. And, you know, it's a natural situation. There are people who don't like you. Health supervisors assured Silkwood that her contamination was minimal. Yet she still had to submit weekly urine and fecal samples for testing. This worried Karen's sister and mother, who paid her a visit that summer. She would bring the jars home from Carmagee, you know, and I'd ask her what they were for, you know, and, oh, mother, they just thought they had a little leak at the plant. She says, nothing to get upset about. And I thought, what an awful job <laughs> you'd have to have to have to do that. And it never, she never really, I don't think she wanted to worry us. Karen put on a brave face for her family, but she was troubled. She believed the company was putting profits before safety, so she increased her involvement in the union. Silkwood was elected to its three-person bargaining committee, becoming the first woman in the company's history to fill that post. She'd go around the plant with a little notebook that she kept in her purse, asking questions. When was the spill? When did it happen? In a rural community where good jobs were hard to come by, some workers resented Karen's activities. As working conditions degenerated at that facility, Karen became more of an activist. You know, being sort of a pushy crusader. A lot of uh, her co-workers felt that she was endangering their jobs. They knew that Kerr McGee had a way of uh, punishing those people who uh, fought the company policy. Silkwood's efforts made her an outcast at work, and the pressure was getting to her. Even her relationship with her boyfriend grew tense. She became depressed and had trouble sleeping. Her doctor prescribed quaaludes, a common sedative. Still. Silkwood was determined to fight for safer conditions at the plant. In September 1974, Karen and two co-workers flew to Washington, D.C., to the headquarters of the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union. They had a long list of alleged safety violations. Silkwood and her friends were shocked when union officials explained that exposure to plutonium could be life-threatening, a fact that Kerr McGee had never revealed. They were never told about how dangerous the material was. They didn't understand that any contamination from plutonium could cause cancer in the future. It was disbelief. You're telling me that all along I've been exposed to this risk? Karen was still trying to absorb this news when she made an offhand remark about another concern that she had, one not on the list. She said that x-rays of fuel rods showed potentially dangerous hairline cracks, but that the data had been altered and the rods had passed inspection. She said she had this concern. She really felt bad about the fact that this quality control data was being tampered with. Union officials were stunned. Faulty fuel rods could cause a nuclear disaster. They needed proof. Karen volunteered to get it. She was willing to recognize that things were not right and that something had to be done about them and she wasn't just willing to go with the flow which was to look the other way. Instead, Karen Silkwood would go undercover, risking her job and her life. By October 1974, 28-year-old Karen Silkwood was feeling deeply betrayed by her employer, Kerr McGee. She had learned for the first time that handling plutonium could cause cancer. Kerr McGee had a responsibility to tell its workers, this is what you're working with, this is what is known about the risk, and here's how to protect yourself. Those three things were never done. Within weeks, the union called a meeting 
at which medical experts explain the hazards of plutonium exposure. At the meeting, which was audio taped, an indignant Karen Silkwood spoke up. If there is something going on, and if we are going to be susceptible to cancer, we're not going to know that in 20 years. Silkwood also believes someone was tampering with quality control records at the plant. Union officials enlisted her to prove it. She began secretly collecting information, jotting down these notes and stealing company documents. Karen was like a foot soldier, you know, uh, working for the union, who was sent behind enemy lines to gather intelligence. The union planned to leak the evidence to New York Times reporter David Burnham. I had this general feeling that this was, uh, you know, this industry was very soft and had been puffed up way out of perspective. So I was looking for chinks in the armor. And she offered a possible chink. For Karen, however, this fight was personal. She was concerned about herself and her fellow workers. On October 7, 1974, she called Steve Wadka, her union contact in Washington, who taped their conversation. In the laboratory, we've got 18 and 19-year-old boys, you know, 20 and 21. And they didn't have the schooling, so they don't understand what radiation is. They don't understand, Steve. Silkwood feared that faulty fuel rods were being shipped out for use in a nuclear reactor. Although she was told to be discreet, her actions put her in jeopardy. It was a major federal offense to steal anything out of a nuclear facility. And that's what she was doing. She was pilfering documents. So uh, she had good reason to be fearful if she were caught. The stress of Silkwood's two months of detective work began to take its toll. She dropped from 115 to 94 pounds and relied on sedatives to get her through the day. Sensing disaster, she asked her family in Texas to find her some job applications. I think that Bill, Karen's father, knew instinctively that she was frightened and that she felt, you know, there was something she had to do and that it was dangerous and he simply told her to do what she thought was right. She was uh, going to give him a two week notice and come home. Uh, she wasn't going to stay with Kerr McGee. But before that could happen, Silkwood made a terrifying discovery. Plutonium was missing from the Kerr McGee plant. Unnerved, she called a former co-worker. She did call me one night, and her biggest concern was material unaccounted for, that Kermagee was not um, keeping complete inventory of how much plutonium they had and where it was. Over 40 pounds of weapons-grade plutonium were missing, enough to make three nuclear bombs. She was distraught, very emotional, as though I'm concerned it's real, but... Other people don't seem to care. Then, on November 5th, at the end of her shift, Karen routinely waved her hands before the radiation meter. She came face to face with what she dreaded most, contamination. She would find that she had contamination on her hands, which were in glove boxes, either meaning the gloves leaked or someone put plutonium inside the gloves. Karen was forced to endure a painful shower with powdered detergent and bleach to remove the deadly plutonium. She returned to the plant the next day. After working in the lab for about an hour, she waved her hands in front of the radiation meter. This time, it was more serious. They scrubbed the skin raw all over her body. It hurt so much that Drew would tell her not to cry because the salt from her tears, you know, burned her skin. They had to scrub every orifice. I mean, it was just nightmarish what she went through. Silkwood's nightmare wasn't over. 
When she returned to work the next morning on November 7th, her contamination was higher than ever. But she had not been working with plutonium since the day before, so the only explanation was that somehow Karen had been exposed to plutonium outside the plant. Her nasal smears were indicating that she had inhaled plutonium. She knew at that point what that meant. She knew it was a death sentence. The company health supervisor suspected that Silkwood had contaminated herself to embarrass Kerr McGee. Once again, she submitted to an intense scrubbing. Karen then agreed to an inspection of her car and the apartment that she shared with a roommate. The car was clean, but her apartment was hot or radioactive. And they found out that her bathroom was incredibly hot. The commode was hot. The sink was hot. There's a trail of the refrigerator that was hot. The refrigerator was hot. Men in protective suits, a Kerr McGee decontamination team descended on Silkwood's apartment. I was called and told to organize a decontamination squad to go down and start cleaning the apartment. When I got down there, they were still loading stuff in barrels. Everything went. The refrigerator, the couch, coffee tables, the television set. Just cleaned it out. Left nothing. She was down there, standing out front bawling, and then she disappeared. I don't know where she went. Karen frantically called her union contact and her family. We were concerned at that point as to what was going to happen to her. In other words, did she have enough at that point in time to immediately kill her? I answered the phone and she was in tears. All she could say was, I'll, I'll be home soon. Then she drove to Oklahoma City to see her boyfriend. And she showed up down here and she was shaking like a leaf. And she was hysterical. She was incoherent and she kept saying over and over again that I'm going to die. Silkwood now believed the company would do anything to stop her. Fearing for her safety, union officials quickly arranged for her to meet with Times reporter David Burnham. But before Karen could meet with the reporter, officials from the Atomic Energy Commission and company doctors insisted that she, Drew, and her roommate be examined at the Center for Nuclear Research in Los Alamos, New Mexico. On November 12th, her friends were told they were clean, but Silkwood learned that she had somehow ingested plutonium. Doctors insisted her radiation levels fell within governmental safety standards and she would be fine. Karen didn't believe them. She was even afraid that kissing Drew would contaminate him. I remember answering the phone and it was her and she was upset. She had all these tests done and they had told her that she was married to cancer. She found out that she was contaminated. Just all of a sudden, three cards showed up in the mail for the kids, belated birthday cards. They hadn't heard from her in about seven or eight months. Still, Karen did not visit her children. Instead, she promised union officials that she would complete her mission. She came back to Oklahoma, and we asked her if she still wanted to proceed with the collection of all the quality control information. She said yes. Karen Silkwood was supposed to deliver those materials the next day, November 13th, to the reporter from the New York Times. She never made it. On November 13th, 1974, Karen Silkwood was still reeling from the news of her plutonium contamination. She went to a union meeting at a coffee shop in Crescent, Oklahoma, where she confided in a co-worker. Karen did tell me that she hadn't was exposed enough that, you know, she would die, you know, from radiation, cancer, or, you know, any way it could affect you many, many ways. But she told me that she would not live. Karen also revealed her plans for that night. She was going to blow the whistle on her employer, Kerr McGee. Karen had all this stuff that she was going to take to Oklahoma City to the Holiday Inn. She had all of it, and she kept flipping through the papers, you know. And she had a big manila folder, 
I'd say a good, it was bigger than an eighth ten, and it was just about that thick. At about 7 p.m., Karen left Crescent to make the 30-mile drive to meet a reporter from the New York Times. About a half an hour later, her Honda was discovered less than 10 miles from Crescent, crumpled into the concrete wall of an underground ditch. The first officer at the scene found her purse, in it two marijuana cigarettes and a quaalude. Papers with a Kerr McGee letterhead were scattered on the ground. He picked them up and put them in the car. Karen's boyfriend, the Times reporter, and her union contact were waiting for her in Oklahoma City. They got a phone call at about 10 p.m. I was the one, I was sitting there with Drew Stevens, her, her boyfriend, and I had to turn around and I had to tell Drew that his girlfriend has been killed. The men drove to the scene of the accident. My memory is Drew had cried, and it was very eerie. And it was a cold night, and the wind was blowing, but we actually found a paperback novel she had been reading. And I remember we got in the car, and we had the, you know, the dome light, the car light on, and it was splattered with her blood. And that was pretty sobering. That night, back in Texas, police informed the Silkwood family that Karen had been killed in a car accident. I was laying in my bed, and I heard the conversation, but I kept thinking, this is just all a dream. I'm just going to lay here long enough and wake up, and it's just not going to be real. After midnight, officials from the Atomic Energy Commission and Karen's employer, Kerr McGee, searched the car at a local garage. The next morning, her boyfriend, the reporter, and the union official had their chance. Papers regarding the issues that we were interested in uh, weren't in there. And she had told us that she had them. And she had told us that she was ready and she was going to be bringing them with her uh, to this meeting. That day, Karen's children were told that their mother had died. Dad had taken us all, put us in the car, and told us we were going to go get some ice cream. And when he said it, it almost seemed like, you know, it was just said in passing. It wasn't like anything to focus on. Of course, you know, I was five years old. But uh, it was kind of like hearing that an aunt or somebody had passed away. It was the day after my birthday. I remember him saying, your mom was killed last night. And, of course, Mike and Dawn had no concept of what had happened. And I just remember going, she's never coming back to get me. She's gone forever. She's really gone now. Karen's family had to bury her in a new dress because all of her clothes had been destroyed by a Kerr-McGee decontamination unit. Authorities ruled Silkwood's death an accident, concluding that she was under the influence of drugs. I would either put her probably either totally asleep or in some t state of stupor from uh, induced by the uh, medication she was taking. It appeared at the scene and from the physical evidence at the scene that she ran off the road of, by herself. But the union suspected foul play and hired an accident reconstruction expert. Her family also hired an investigator. They disputed the official findings the medical examiner's report found high levels of quaaludes in Silkwood's bloodstream. However, their research indicated that she was conscious just moments before impact. I noticed that the extent of physical damage that she had uh, was inconsistent with someone who was, had fallen asleep at the wheel and or uh, someone who was intoxicated. That she, in fact, it showed me that she was stiff and braced. They also found fresh dents in the car's rear bumper. In my opinion, and the people that I've had working with me, there's no circumstantial evidence there to indicate that somebody may, hit, another vehicle may have hit the car in the rear. The nagging question, was Karen Silkwood murdered? I think Kerr McGee paid somebody to run her off the road. After Karen died, Dad 
didn't work a whole lot anymore. He devoted his life to trying to find out exactly what was going on and what happened to Karen and who killed her. Now, you know, Oklahoma's pretty flat and there are not all that many culverts. And for someone to have planned this as a way of murdering is just impossible. It could not have been a planned murder. I think it's possible that someone set out to scare her. In the months after her death, government reports verified many of Silkwood's accusations against Kerr McGee, including the falsification of quality control records. The Atomic Energy Commission also concluded that Silkwood could not have contaminated herself because the plutonium she ingested had come from a restricted area at the plant. That mystery remains. In 1976, two years after her death, Karen Silkwood's family filed a civil suit charging Kerr McGee with willful negligence in allowing Karen to be contaminated with plutonium. Three years later, a jury awarded the Silkwood estate ten and a half million dollars. I feel that it, uh, Karen has been vindicated and what she was saying was true and I think the American public believes her now. It sends a message to uh, the government and uh, to the nuclear industry that they have to tell the truth and that if they don't tell the truth they have to be prepared to pay the fiddler. Karen Silkwood has been hailed as a whistleblower who paid the ultimate price for her convictions. Because she died and because the women's movement and the anti-nuke movement and others uh, latched onto her body and, you know, exploited it and sometimes shamelessly, it became a very big and powerful force for those who opposed nuclear energy. And I think that that is part of the reason the Silkwood story was such a big deal. When I talk to my children about Karen, I tell them how proud I am of her and that she chose. She, it, it was a hard road to go for her to take a stand like she did in her job and trying to help the people of Kermagee. She could have easily walked away, came home, and left it. But that wasn't her. For Silkwood's children, her legacy is more complex and painful. For a long time, I just absolutely, for lack of better way to describe it, I hated her. As I've gotten older and as I've had children, I have done a lot of forgiving to Karen. I sometimes think that maybe because of whatever the circumstances were, that she couldn't be there for her children, that she made out to society, and she was there for mankind. I'd just like to find out a little bit about her, find out what her feelings for her family were, maybe find out if she could do it all over again, would she, if she had done it and known what the outcome was going to be, would she still be as willing to give up everything for what she believed in?